So we're here to talk about your relatively recently published book, The Very Hungry City. Um, and I'd like it if you just go ahead and start off with telling us sort of the premise of the book. Uh, so The Very Hungry City is a book about cities and energy, and it basically looks at cities as consumers of energy. Uh, there's been a lot of work done looking at uh, how individual buildings consume energy and how efficient they are, uh, how, how individual businesses um, or cars uh, consume energy and how efficient they are. But very, uh, relatively little has been done on looking at an entire city as an organism that essentially consumes energy. Um, I'm looking at it from an economic perspective about how uh, being virtuous in that way actually can be of potential economic benefit to the city. What gave you the idea of sort of framing this, these issues from that perspective? I think it's a more powerful argument than, um, than the environmental perspective. Uh, we, can, we can really reach a lot more people if we couch this in terms of things like jobs and investment, uh, competitiveness, and so forth. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I guess that sort of uh, bridges to another question. I mean, why on a city level? So lots has been written on, on efficiency and, uh, for individuals and uh, in individual homes, individual buildings, businesses, things like that. Um, and that's, that's uh, ground that's been well trodden. Um, less has been written about cities as kind of metabolic organisms. Uh, I'm not the first to talk about urban metabolism. Um, I, in the book I mentioned, uh, there's a sanitary engineer named Abel Wallman who first brought this up in the 60s, this concept. But he was sort of looking at all inputs and outputs in, in a city, and, and I'm s focusing here specifically on energy. What about some of the main determinants of, of energy metabolism? Oh, there's a lot that I don't talk about, but the ones I do talk about are um, uh, climate control for buildings, so heating and cooling of buildings, which is a huge you know, uh, portion of the energy mix. It's, it's probably close to about 40%. Um, I talk about water and uh, the delivery of water inner basin transfers and um, you know, also things like filtration and uh, water recycling, desalination, that kind of stuff. Um, and then I talk about transportation. I don't talk about industrial energy. I'm mainly looking at the, the bones of a city, the infrastructure of a city, and not so much at the you know, f individual factories or things like that, which is a much more complicated issue. And, and, and it's very hard to predict how it's going to differ from one city to another. And it really varies on what the industry is and things like that. Yep. Um, so. Did you just give us some examples of solutions that you cite in the book? There's some very interesting free market um, uh, examples of, of what can be done out there harnessing the market um, without e any government inter inter interaction at all. Um, and I talked about a group called Transcend Equity, which goes out and they hunt for inefficient buildings and then they essentially buy the energy bill for inefficient buildings and they retrofit and upgrade these buildings and then that company who occupies that space has to keep paying to Transcend Equity whatever they used to pay to the utility company and Transcend Equity is paying a fraction on that utility bill that, that used to be really high. And they, may, and they make a lot of money that way. I looked at transportation, um, and I, you know, I talked about the biking system in Copenhagen, which is really one of the great success stories about how, uh, by popular demand, uh, a city took on the automobile uh, lobby <laughs> and essentially redesigned itself for bikes instead of cars and, and invested hundreds of millions of dollars in bike infrastructure and now 38 percent of the people bike every day to work. Um, you know, I talk about Stockholm's Metro which is one of the you know, envies of the world. You know, we're, you know, there's 75 percent of the people are commuting into town on the AM commute on public transit. Even LA, what their attempts to their Measure R, which is going to spend twenty billion dollars on over twenty billion dollars on massive transportation improvements, including huge rail extensions and subway subway investments and so forth. Yep. Um, some of the examples, especially the positive examples, are are taken from Europe. What do you think is the main driver as far as those cities being much more successful from an energy standpoint? Number one, you know. In those countries, energy has been expensive for a long time. They've taxed energy very highly, so that's really important. Also, these cities, they were built a long time ago, so they have compact, old, mixed-use cores that are sort of pre-automobile in their design. The other thing is they're regional um, in nature, most of these governments, so uh, city planning is very different over there. Do you think that there's policy that, um, you know, could be put in place in the United States that would move our city development in, in a way that will increase efficiency also? There's a million policies we could do. 
Um, the question is at what level? Um, right now, a, a lot of great work is being done by mayors and city councils at the city level. The problem is we have uh, tens of thousands of independent, independent jurisdictions in this country. So you could have 100 jurisdictions doing great stuff, but if the other 18,000 you know, are not doing anything, um, th that's a problem. Then you, you have uh, you know, a typical race to the bottom where you know, a couple of cities do some wonderful regulations, but that increases the cost of doing business, and so the businesses just go to the places that aren't doing the regulations. Um, it, it sets up a reverse system. So <clears throat> what you do need is consistency and you need some, um, a level playing field, and, and really I think regional planning would help a lot. So, yeah. Sure. Um, so far we've sort of had the um, luxury of, of developing how we've been de developing. Do you see limits to the way that we've been doing things? Um, well, I think that um, there's uh, a number of external factors that could make life a little more complicated in coming years for cities um, um, that will put stresses on them that haven't been there before. Um, so obviously climate change is one of them. And then of course the, all the peaks, peak, peak oil, peak minerals, peak uh, whatever else, peak water, all these kinds of you know, resources that are getting harder to come by. Um, you know, I'm not a gloom and doom person. I think there, there's going to be substitutes. I think we'll always be able to get water, I think we'll always be able to get source, you know, f fuels to, to, to generate energy, um, but it's, it's going to be, it's just going to be more expensive for all these things. So the question really comes down to bottom line, can cities afford um, to be profligate or wasteful? This book is a pretty optimistic book and the focus is really on the solutions, although the problems are, are the framing for the whole book. It's the solutions that I like to end on. So. Perfect. <laughs>